beginning of a May 7th meeting of EAH. Mac, how about a little humor to start as we look at the Alawite? Well, as you may remember, uh, what, the last time I quoted Albert Einstein when he said the difference between genius and stupidity was that genius had its limitations. So today, to keep that high level of intellect going, I'm going to qu quote Yogi Berra who said, the future, it just ain't what it used to be. <laughs> it just ain't what it used to be, which, which uh, I guess is still as much true today as it was back in the 1950s when Yogi Berra said it, if he really said it, because another thing that he said was, I never said most of the things I said. Then again, I might have said it, <laughs> but you never know. So... Back to you, Phil. Okay, and just for a minute, uh, Andrew and um, everyone, uh, have your video on for a moment. Evan, good to see you. Oh, hi there. All right. Howard, our speaker for today, I'd like to call on Lee, right? Lee Mansfield, a former president of EAH. Happy to uh, introduce a friend and fellow engineer, Mike Elhoff. Uh, Mike and I go back to the days of Berkeley Engineering when he worked uh, for Peter Hansen as, as his right-hand mechanical engineer. Mike went on to found his own company, Hawaii Engineering Services. I think he carried on the, the great service right. tradition of Peter Hansen of Berkeley Engineering. He, he truly is a guy I go to when I've got an equipment or pump problem and I know I'm going to get some really, really good advice. I'll let you just slide right into your presentation. Yeah, thanks everybody. And thanks for your uh, kind words. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm actually a Marine engineer and those first that video you showed was close to home because I, I spent my initial career uh, working on ships um, and Marine engineering encompasses a lot of electromechanical uh, systems, hydraulics, engines, thermodynamics and back then when you were all young folks uh we ran steamships so uh and then now it's all diesel and computerized but anyway um that uh kind of where i got my start and i i often tell people that um we had a sign over the machine shop on our ship our training ship and it said out here you can't walk home so that taught a valuable lesson about you better figure out how stuff works or else you're going to be the bottom of the ocean. So yeah, that's uh, where I got my training, California Maritime Academy. Uh, I did my EIT, but chose not to pursue a PE um, and ended up into uh, manufacturing and sales in Australia, working for a pump manufacturer, and then in sales in Hawaii, working for a a distributor of uh, municipal and industrial equipment that Lee alluded to. And, and uh, yeah, so I had some good mentorship both in Australia and, and in, in Hawaii. And then, um, so it's been 26 years since I started Hawaii Engineering Services and our primary uh, market is municipal, uh, wastewater treatment, pumping control systems, so. That's me. We have 20 employees and uh, we have a full service division. So we do, we, we have to be able to, just like that machine shop logo, uh, our commitment is to be able to fix anything that we provide. Yeah, and thank you everybody. Uh, it's an honor to speak to you. And I, um, you know, hopefully it will be worthy of your time and I'll try to get through as much as I can. So I start, with this and I, I, you know, my dad always told me, uh, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. So I'm volunteering my, my uh, particularly my pumping experience is how this got started because the Army Corps was looking at pump stations in the canal. And then having lived here for 35 years and having lived in upper watershed of Palolo, actually at 600 feet elevation, uh, Manoa. Um, I actually lived on a sailboat in the LOI. 
So I've, I've hiked and ocean and everything. And I think that's an important component of anybody who, you know, looks at a system is to look at it holistically and to look at it, not just uh, with your expertise, but to listen to other people uh, and to look at your own experience. So I stepped into this uh, trying to bridge the gap because I saw that a 10 or 15 or 20 year struggle uh, to resolve this situation. And the, the community pounding their fists saying the Army Corps is not listening and the Army Corps saying, but we've given you every option. And, and then this community saying, but you're not listening. And so um, I've tried to step in and offer what I saw after really digesting this for a good part of a year and looking at all the data as to break this down to a five-step solution and there's a lot of components within those five steps. Um, Bob pointed out, you know, the streams themselves are, that's a whole nother study. So, um, but there's been a lot of studies done, a lot of money spent, um, a lot of scope changes. And I've tried to be respectful to both the Army Corps with the, the tools they've been given, the budget they've been given, the scope they've been given, as well as the community um, and so that's, so here we go. So I like to start this with this slide because to me, my, my experience is the biggest loss here is that we have this amazing body of water right in the heart of, you know, uh, Waikiki that is com almost completely unused other than canoe paddlers who for fear of death fall into this body of water. So so that, and you can also see in this picture some crumbling concrete and that is uh, gonna come back in this presentation. This is a five-step solution. And I presented this to Army Corps, uh, some legislators, DLNR, city council members, community. Uh, so in various evolutions. So this is the latest evolution. So this is really the five steps and basically um, number one is to increase the watershed absorption and minimize erosion from invasive pigs and plants. So when I came into this, I'm a pump guy. I know how the water moves, but in the, in the scheme of things, this is where it all starts is in the forest. And this is so neglected in, around the world as, you know, mother nature figures this stuff out and then we figure out how to screw it up. So. Number two is integrated detention basins at the LOI golf course and in Manoa. Number three is dredge the canal to its original 15 to 25 foot depth. Number four is to install a 30 cubic feet per second fresh seawater pump. And by fresh seawater, I mean from the ocean at Kapahulu Pier and micro tunnel to the canal. Number five is to install 3,000 cubic feet per second stormwater pumps and floodgates at the Alamoana Bridge and at the Manoa Palolo confluence to minimize upward walls and address triple flood threat. So I'll try to roll through these, but that's pretty much it as far as what I think needs to happen. So here's a pictorial summary of the uh, canal related issues and particularly pumping requirements. So the video showed that we get uh, seven and a half times the rainfall in the mountains as we do here in this picture. Um, and that's important to remember. And the video also showed a significant debris field which contributed to the Manoa and area flooding in 2004, I think. Um, and those are two key components to this is to look at this holistically. So first and foremost, uh, as far as pumping, I'm proposing to put a fresh seawater pump at the end of the Kapahulu Pier. It's a submersible pump out of sight, and that will deliver 30 cubic feet per second of fresh seawater up the underneath the Kapahulu through a micro tunnel, and that will then exit at the Kapahulu end of the canal providing that continuous 24 seven flow out the harbor. Uh, number two is uh, to put a golf course detention and debris basin 
uh, integral to the golf course so that the golf course can still function, but uh, it will serve to some small capacity what this entire, uh, what you're looking at used to be, and that's a wetland. And wetlands we know have enormous benefit, but we got rid of it and we dug this canal. And we dug this canal single-ended. So they originally intended for Kapahulu to connect to the ocean, but they realized that, that uh, all that debris and mud and, and silt no, no longer being captured by the wetlands would end up out on Waikiki itself and sort of dissuade tourists from coming. So they didn't connect it. And now it's a dead end stagnant body of water with some tidal influence. And then uh, we put at the Manoa Palolo confluence, that's a critical component of this. And that's where the majority of the storm flow comes in. And you can kind of see an angled uh, tree lined right at the bottom of the golf course. And that's really the critical bottleneck that the army is seeing is gonna risk flooding Waikiki and the surrounding area because they said it can't get out to canal fast enough. So they proposed a giant pump station right there. They originally proposed the giant pump station to the right side where I have the Alamoana Boulevard bridge. And then they moved it back to this uh, golf course area to push the water out the canal. Um, and so I'm proposing two pump stations and they're really pump gates. So a pump station in an Army Corps sense, you'll see some pictures, is an above ground structure, uh, giant gates, giant pumps. And this is a submerged pump gate where the pumps are integral to two swinging gates that only function when required. So that's the summary picture. Um, and the first two are addressed by absorb absorption, erosion, from pigs and plants, and second, an integrated detention basin. So this is how debris, erosion, and rainfall capac uh, capacity are influenced by these two. And if you don't look at root cause, then you're just trying to band-aid or, or keep up with this enormous flow of water that could have otherwise been both reduced and the debris field, which is going to significantly introduce variables during a storm event. So this is the uh, confluence from Makiki. Um, I have a photographer friend who lives right there. And fortunately, I called him and said, hey, can you get a picture? Because I searched the internet and there's almost no pictures of the debris field either entering the canal, the canal itself, or the uh, harbor area. So this was a great, you, you can see the chocolate milk coming down from Makiki. And the Palolo Manoa is, I believe it's four, three or four times the flow coming in at Makiki. And then you can see after the rain event, uh, just a fraction of the debris ending up in the canal. And that's gonna settle then and then require dredging. And this was the only internet reference I could find to a dirty canal. And it was the harbor itself. And it basically says, you know, you don't want to get in this water in it. So eliminate feral pigs. So I, I uh, know, I, I know I lived in Manoa in the forest, actually. My, I built a tree house and uh, lived in with these pigs for a good part of 10 years. So I saw in Palolo the invasive plant species and the pigs eating mangoes, eating whatever they can and re reproducing at uncontrolled rates. And so um, I'm not out to uh, get rid of pig hunting uh, or anything else. And I, as I told the Army Corps and the community, I'm only gonna present and I'm not gonna argue for this stuff. You guys can sort it out, but my, I'm just gonna present ideas. So um, there's a lady called uh, Emma Ewan works for DLNR Forestry and she, is an expert in this watershed. And DLNR is probably one of the most underfunded state agencies, as we can see that shows in different areas. And if you don't get funding, you don't get solutions. So um, obviously wise spending if you do get funding. 
So my argument is that why he's fending is to fence this watershed, not the whole island, but to fence this watershed from invasive pigs and to eliminate those pigs from this watershed. And they can hunt pigs in everywhere else that they are. Uh, and then the invasive plant species that are also contributing to the erosion uprooting um, because this uh, lack of absorption and this erosion and this debris field that, that caused a lot of the watershed or the uh, woodlawn flooding, I believe was a direct result of the forest watershed. So it has the benefits there and they seem pretty obvious to me, but that's, uh, that's money well spent. And I believe it's the, it's the very first thing that needs to be done. And then the dredging. So we're trying to keep up with all this debris. And so every 10 years, the DLNR is tasked with dredging the canal. And that generally moves to 15 years or 12 years. And then they dredge it to say five to 10 to 12 feet. Um, and then another 10 years goes by. And in that 10 years, it's filled back up again. So at any given time, if we get this uh, 100 year storm, Keep in mind that the dredging is good chance it's not going to have just been done. It could be overdue. It could be, you know, five years into it. And we're never dredging down to its original depth of 15 to 25 feet. And when I say 15, that is down at the Kapahulu sort of golf course area. And 25 is at the harbor uh, Alamoana Bridge. And then we want to, I would suggest uh, you're never going to clean the water up unless you introduce fresh seawater. This is a hundred year band aid, the dredging. And I just kind of alluded to that whole process and cycle. Um, but basically, it's always done too shallow. Um, it doesn't address the root cause of what, why are we having to dredge this frequently. And, uh, and then the water pollution components and all that debris. And I've scuba dove uh, all the Hawaiian islands and I can tell you that the healthiest reef systems are where there was no sugarcane agriculture or, um, or these uh, rivers and streams that have erosion dumping onto those coral reefs. This is the current dredging that's going on at $21 million and they are digging from eight to 12 feet. And that is overdue by I believe, uh, I believe they're at 12 to 15 years from the previous dredging. So a fresh seawater pump is going to do two things. It, will, it won't instill two feet per second of velocity and carry heavy particles out the canal, but it will give some velocity. It's got sort of a very lazy river effect. Um, but more importantly, it's going to continuously bring fresh seawater. So when we do have storm events or water quality issues, they're going to be less impacted. There'll be less drastic impacts out in the harbor and the ocean itself. And this was, uh, un and this wasn't my idea. This was in 2015. The DLNR did a study of the Alawai Canal flushing system and the golf course detention. In my search for what, how did we get here, they said exactly that. They said 30 cubic feet per second will address water quality. And uh, then using the golf course as a detention will significantly reduce that debris ending up in the canal and the ocean itself. This is where I propose to put this pump. It's a submersible propeller pump. It's encased in a polyethylene tube. Uh, so minimal corrosion, it has zinc anodes and it needs to be pulled maybe once a year for inspection, zinc replacement. And it would be out of sight and attached to the very end of that pier, sitting in about 10 feet of water with a giant, um, screen to keep people out and anything else out. And that's what the pump looks like. And that shows in this curve that we would draw about 35 horsepower at peak flow at 30 cubic feet per second. So 35 horsepower, about 25 
kilowatts, give or take 24 hours a day. So uh, the Army Corps is not tasked with water quality. They're not tasked with forest restoration. Uh, they used to be, and then they, that was eliminated from their scope. So they, uh, by uh, Congress's budget and directive, they're only allowed to look at flood, Malka flood events. So then they proposed a whole bunch of solutions to deal with uh, Malka flood events. And one of them was to install a, I believe 7,000 or 10,000 cubic feet per second pump station at the Alamoana Bridge. And since then that has moved towards the golf course. So my suggestion, as I said, was to install two pump gates, each with a 3,000 cubic feet per second capacity. And with all the other solutions, I believe 3,000 cubic feet per second uh, should be sufficient. I'm not uh, the complete expert on that subject, and I don't want to butt heads with the Army Corps on their calculations. Um, but I think if you look at this holistically, uh, that that's a more reasonable flow. And I also think a 1% flood event is um, at the risk of it happening and somebody going, Mike Elhoff said it was never gonna happen. Um, I think a 50 year storm is a more reasonable investment. Um, and I think the uh, city and others have kind of hinted that that might be a more reasonable compromise. Um, and I think with a 50 year storm or 5% event that this would be uh, certainly more feasible to go down to 3000 cubic feet per second and to have two pumps, two pump uh, locations. So one thing the, the Army Corps cannot look at, and that is uh, items two and three, which is a category five hurricane storm coming from the south or if sea level rise, groundwater inundation. We know that sea level is rising and when it rises, it, ri it brings up the groundwater and we see that happening in uh, Mapuna Puna and we see it happening around the world wherever you have seawater influence on groundwater, especially king tides. So because the army can't look at this, I've questioned whether we should um, go back to Congress and say, let's increase the scope to consider all sources of flooding. And more importantly, let's not do something on the Malka flooding that's going to make the other two even worse. And that's what I'm proposing might be happening right now. So we've had discussions and meetings and there's doubt, at least how I could summarize on the part of Army Corps, whether it's either storm surge or groundwater inundation are either as great a risk or uh, will not be addressed by their current solution or, or, or made worse by their current solution. So I'm not convinced of that. And I think that the scope needs to be reconsidered, not only to add the forest restoration, but to deal with this triple threat. So if you live in, Maki in um, Waikiki or um, any of these areas that you see in this picture and, and the Army Corps spends $500 million or whatever, uh, and you still flood, uh, I'm gonna call my a representative and say, why do we just spend all this money? My house is still underwater. So that's really what I'm trying to do is I don't live in this area, but I'm trying to put myself in their shoes. So um, there is a, a conflict between experts at the University of Hawaii, whether storm surge will inundate this area and how badly and from the beach or up the canal or a combination of those two. Uh, as best I can tell, a storm surge having seen an Iki, um, is it will topple Waikiki Beach. It'll go up on to, all the way to Kuhio, and then it needs a place to escape. Um, it will also come up the canal and it will overtop the banks of the canal in both directions. So my suggestion is that the Army Corps building walls up in the canal are going to reduce the evacuation rate 
if those two come. Yes, the walls will reduce flooding coming up the canal into Waikiki, but um, will not address flooding coming from Waikiki through the existing stormwater system, especially against walls. So again, I mentioned this 1%, I think a reasonable uh, solution that doesn't create this concrete monster in Waikiki might be a five, a 50 year storm. Storms from rain events are uh, portrayed as a hydrograph and the blue line is the actual rain. Um, and the red line is the impact to that rain um, sometime after the initial rain event. So you're gonna get some absorption, dispersion, and, and this is just a generic drawing. The purple dash line is what we might be able to mitigate using pumps. So we might not be able to eliminate the peak of the storm, but you can see we can, before the storm hits, we can turn the pumps on and run those pumps to minimize and reduce that peak. This is an Army Corps, uh, one of many slides that showed during that hydrograph, and this one is uh, the peak water surface in the canal. Uh, and this was a 12 o'clock noon um, event. So an hour and a half after that event started, uh, the LOI canal peaked. And you can see the cubic feet per second entering from each of those areas. And I questioned the 1370 in the Waikiki area, if we have seven and a half times the amount of rainfall uh, annually in the mountains, as we do down at the shoreline, then are we really gonna see 1370 cubic feet at the same time? I don't know. But if we do, is the existing stormwater system able to handle that? Uh, and, and again, that doesn't even consider groundwater inundation or uh, sea level rise. So, but this is an important slide because you can see where they think the water is gonna come under a, a hundred year storm. And certainly the bulk of it is coming from Manoa Palolo. So they came up with a bunch of value engineering proposals during many years of studies and value engineering proposal four was to put um, a pump station at the El Moana Bridge. And it's hard to see from this picture, but basically that blue curved line that's coming up from the left and then tapering level is your elevation of water in the canal. And you can see by putting gates and pumps at the harbor on the left, they draw down the canal to minus five feet, but back at the Manoa Palolo confluence in the middle of this graph, there is almost no impact on pumping down at the harbor. And this is where I think they didn't possibly look at dredging properly, at uh, putting multiple pump gates um, and sloping the canal. And you can see on the right side, there's two bullet points and underneath the second bullet point are another two bullet points. And the, sec the first of those says the canal acts as a channel, which is long and narrow and needs a sloping water surface to flow. So sloping water surface versus sloping water bottom. Again, I'm, I'm not an expert at hydrology, but I think it needs a serious look at dredging from 15 to 25 feet, keeping it uh, the debris out so that they don't have to dredge every 10 years or even five years to keep that 10 to 15 to 25 feet and putting two pump systems in to move that water out the canal quickly and to turn those pumps on before the storm event. So this is an example, again, I'm not a hydrologist, but I think somebody should look at, you know, if we slope the bottom of the canal and keep it clean and maybe, you know, uh, smooth walls, is it gonna flow quicker? Um, there was several unanswered questions that I couldn't resolve in my discussions. One was any modeling done to slope the floor. Uh, what about dewatering the entire canal by building an El Moana pump gate first excavating the entire canal to 25 feet uh, or 15 to 25. Um, and then uh, you got those pump gates at the Alamoana Harbor 
that can evacuate the canal and then you put in bulldozers instead of trying to suck it out with a barge. Uh, and then use the harbor gates to drain the entire canal to maximum capacity with the harbor pumps uh, placed 22 feet down. And then you basically are using the entire canal as a pre-storage as that storm starts to come into it and therefore reduce that hydrograph peak. And then we need to study the drainage of Waikiki from Kalakaua to Kuhio to the Alawai Boulevard and see how it can address storm and um, groundwater inundation and Malka flood events. And this is the ACE model of a 1% flood zone. And in the blue, you can see you're underwater. In the red, you're under threat at uh, two to three. These are meters. No, these are feet, must be feet. Um, and so basically, if you're in the blue zone, you're underwater for sure. And red zone, you're probably underwater and so on. And so the idea to me is to keep, use that canal as a drainage um, basin and turn those pumps on only when you see 50 year or 100 year events or when you really are gonna overtop these wall existing walls. And then again, the category five hurricane from the south and the green groundwater. So this is a UH study that was done showing storm surge flooding. And you can see it looks somewhat similar to the Malka flooding. And so you really should think about dealing with both. And currently the ACE scope is not. And then one reason is they say, we don't agree with this model. So, I'm not going to be in the middle of that argument, but some people think this is an accurate model and some people don't. Um, comments from local experts regarding coastal flooding. Both the beach side and canal side are highly vulnerable to flooding. I'm not sure where they're getting the 50 year time horizon for groundwater inundation. So the Army Corps thinks it's going to take 50 years before we see groundwater inundation from sea level rise. Uh, I agree the canal area will be the first to see flooding from overtopping before the beach side and goes on to explain that. But certainly it says, uh, for example, the LOI will be impacted by storm surge before Kalakaua because it's lower lying. But that's if you're only taking into account still water levels, not wave setup, which would likely push water into the streets on the ocean side. This is an Army Corps uh, concept that uh, ended up on the news. I don't know if the Army Corps drew this, but somebody drew this and ended up on the news as to what an elegant upward wall would look like in the Waikiki Alloy Canal. And so uh, my frustration is that the community doesn't want it. And I see why, and it, it, this is as good as I've seen in, in a, a depiction, but really you're, you're walling off an amazing water resource that we should be jumping in, splashing around in. And this is the sea level rise inundation flood zone model. And here you can see if uh, sea level rise as 10 years from now, 25 years, and the Army Corps thinks it's 50 years, but uh, science, scientists I talk to uh, do not feel, they feel it's, it's going to keep escalating over the next uh, decade, two decades. So how do we deal with this flooding? So if you put walls up and you don't evacuate the canal, there's nowhere for that water to go. So this is why a pump gate at the Alamoana Bridge, Alamoana Boulevard Bridge, which could evacuate the canal even three or four feet would act as a drainage basin for the sea level rise and pushing it back out. So the problem with walls upward is they limit drainage from Waikiki from all sources. They obstruct the view and access. They require a complete redesign of all buried utilities and they do not fix the crumbling canal wall foundation and therefore no pump down storage capacity and no inundation drainage. So, those walls that are in the canal, as you saw from the first picture, were never really structurally built prop, uh, you know, for beyond their 100 year life. So they have been patched and 
partially fixed in areas by DLNR, but the majority uh, is questionable in its structural integrity. So how do we build walls on top of them or go up? You have to build berms and come in and start to eat away at the, you know, the bike path area, and then you got utilities under there. Uh, pump down storage, you are utilizing pumping and floodgates, which can minimize or avoid canal walls. Pump gates can handle 3,000 cubic feet per second and allow canoe access when not in use. Uh, watershed absorption and detention basins reduce that peak flow and turning the pumps on hours before any major storm event will lower the canal level before the peak flow and address the triple threat. This was a uh, Army Corps value engineering advantages. This was in their document and it says uh, gates this was their giant pump station they were going to put at the Alamoana Bridge. And it, it, it basically acknowledges that we can do exactly what I'm proposing. And, and that's to uh, elevation, bring the elevation down. And with optimization, this alternative can provide the 1% event level of protection and replace all the measures currently part of Alternative would only consist of this one measure project impacts would only occur, no detention basins and flood walls would be needed. So since that was written, the Army Corps has shifted and said, no, that pump station's not gonna be able to do it because of the, the water's not gonna get out of Manoa Palolo confluence fast enough. Um, this is a giant Army Corps station and I don't think anybody wants to look at that. This is their proposed Manoa Palolo pump station. Nobody wants to look at it or listen to it. Uh, this is where they propose putting it at the Alamona Bridge. And then the dark blue is where I've proposed to put pump gates and a generator house on the already empty old LOI boat yard area. And this is again, is an Army Corps typical above ground pump station and gates. And this is the submerged pump gate. So these pumps are down submerged right now and operating holding, uh, pulling the water through and pushing it. And that's what the pump looks like. Similar to the fresh seawater pump, there would be six in each gate. The gates would swing open uh, when not in use and the pumps would raise up out of the seawater when not in use. And that's where the Alamoana one would go, right into that bridge. And that's how they would open. And that's the pumps again in the down position operating. And this is the pumps in the up position not operating and not in use. And so full access to the canal, this, the pumps are not rotting in seawater and they're fully accessible from either shoreline for service. The back side of the gates or the, the front side of the gates where the water is being pulled through. And then this, I don't have time to go through, but basically this is the summary and we need Congress to increase the Army Corps scope. We need to fix the forest um, and look at this holistically. So that's what I got. Um, thank you. I'm sorry it takes so long, but uh, I will shut up now and open up the floor. Mm -hmm.